Good morning. Welcome to Champlain United Methodist Church. My name is Max Richter. I'm pastor here, and we are delighted as the staff and volunteers to welcome you to this time of worship. As we gather together across the miles, grab your cup of coffee or tea and get comfortable as we welcome God's presence in our midst. We're so proud to say that we, the people of Champlain United Methodist Church, are a progressive and inclusive witness of our tradition here in the Northwest Metro, and we're delighted that you are with us wherever you are joining us and whenever you join us in this time of worship. May God bless our meditations of our hearts, and may the, those words speak to who we are becoming in Christ's name. Amen. We open with this song, There's a Balm in Gilead. <clears throat> I'd like to invite the kids to gather around for children's time if you're off doing something else, and the adults to reflect also on this time of honoring the child within all of us. So, 
I got some help from Miss Julia today for my illustration for the children's time. This is from the music studio. Can anybody tell me on the camera, what do you think this is? You see it? What do we got here? There's some paisleys. That's this little design on here. We got the lid. What do you think might be inside of here? Any guesses? Could it be um, some stickers? Sure. Could it be, um, let's see, what else would Julia have in her studio? Um, could it be percussion things? Well, it's kind of small for that. Let's see what's in here. Okay, so we open the top very carefully. Oh, gosh. Now, some of you take lessons from Miss Julia, don't you? So you know what's in here. Oh, my goodness, what's this? Can you see it on the camera? Okay, this is what is known as a pixie stick. Can anybody tell me what's inside of here? I know your parents can, because <laughs> this is pure sugar, right? So if you're gonna have these, how many would you have at once? What's the recommended amount of these? Okay, so I'm gonna ask the music staff if they have an opinion on this. So, Riley and Julia, how many of these were, would you say is the right amount of these to have? At least three. <laughs> At least three. Okay, so we're going to get three. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to do a grape. We got orange and we got what? pink, the flavor pink, <laughs> which I'm, I can't read that. Um, we're going to say that's strawberry or cherry. I don't know. We're going to cherry. Julia, is this how many we should be having? I missed the blue one. Uh, okay, blue. There's a blue raspberry is not my favorite, um, but there's a blue one in here too, which is awesome if you like that. Be that as it may. So, thinking about, do you, have you heard the word temptation before? That's a word that we think about during Lent, especially, which is coming soon. But it's something that we deal with every day. Like sometimes we do things or we overdo things and we do things that we shouldn't like so what if I was gonna instead of three of these see if I can get a blue one this time what if okay here we go oh no blue keep going mm, it smells like cotton candy Ugh. okay so what if, what if I was gonna eat this many pixie sticks would that be fun would your parents think that was a good idea? Would your teachers think that's a good idea? I don't think so. Would your pastor think that's a good idea? Definitely not. So I'm not promoting this, but what I'm saying is sometimes we're tempted to do things more than what we should, and they, that would harm us because everyone would be really crazy after you eat one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven pixie sticks. That's not recommended. So we all have things we're tempted to do that aren't good for us. Like maybe it's to, you want to, you feel like hitting someone when you're mad. Or maybe it's you're really hard on yourself after you make a mistake. Or maybe it's, um, you know, saying a mean word. Has anybody ever done that? I know I have. I didn't mean to. So what we need to do in those times is when we need to make better choices, we ask God to help us and we talk about it with our families and we talk about it in Sunday school, and we talk about it as a church staff. How can we do better to show people God's love? So whatever it is that you might be tempted to do this week, because is it stressful living and learning in COVID time? It is. And so we need to help each other out the best we can when we're feeling tempted to do something that might, might not be good for us or good for other people. Because in the Methodist tradition, we say, do no harm. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. Let's join together in this call to worship. Gracious God, as the sun steps down and makes space for the moon to shine, as the light draws near and stillness begins to settle in all around us, 
we take this moment to give thanks for this day. Thank you, God, for every breath. Thank you, God, for every smile. Thank you, God, for every step toward justice. Thank you, God, for another day of life. Thank you, God, for your love. We rest in gratitude for your grace. We rest comforted by your spirit. And we rest because you are God alone. Amen. <clears throat> As uh, we continue with this morning prayer, so think about how your life has gone this week. And when the prayer begins, it's in the first person singular, the I. So imagine that you are saying this prayer as you hear me share this prayer with you, okay? See if this speaks to your life this week. Let us pray. Dear God, I haven't been able to fix it. And while tumbling through the messiness, reaching out for moments of grace, for efforts of truth, for some kind of hope to cling to, I keep realizing that I cannot. Sure, there is the work and there are moves and the whole firm and steadfast power of presence, but it is still broken. And no relentless trying of mine will mend it. And so I went for a walk <laughs> again, this time in the snow. And with every step, with every crunch, with every cold, deep breath, and every time I looked up into the squinty-eyed, cloud-bright sky, I did what the church who raised me always taught me to do. I gave it to you. And some days, I'm not even sure I even know what that means. <laughs> but God, this one is yours. This hurt, this worry, this fear, hold it. This struggle, this suffering, this wound. Hold it. This ongoing, still totally complicated, unbelievably painful whole situation. Hold it. And if you would, heal us. Hold us and heal us, please. In your name we pray. Amen. The Hebrew scripture from the book of Deuteronomy. The name of God again is Yahweh, which is the way of saying, writing out the impronounceable name of God in the Hebrew scriptures. Yahweh, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. To that prophet you must listen. It was this that you asked of Yahweh your God on Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear again the voice of Yahweh our God, nor let us see this great fire again or we will die. And Yahweh said to me, this is well said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their people and into whose mouth I will put my words and that person will tell them all that I command. If any person will not listen to the words which my prophet speaks in my name, I will myself call that person to answer for this. But if a prophet presumes to speak in my name a message that I have not commanded to be spoken or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet will die. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson from Mark. The first chapter. They came to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and began to teach. And the people were spellbound by the teaching, because Jesus thought, taught with an authority that was unlike their religious scholars. <clears throat> Suddenly, a person with an unclean spirit appeared in the synagogue. It shrieked, What do you want from us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? For I know who you are the Holy Son of God. Jesus rebuked the spirit sharply. Be quiet. Come out of that person. And the unclean spirit convulsed the possessed one violently, and with a loud shriek, out it came. And all who looked on were amazed. They began to ask each other, what is this? 
a new teaching with such authority. This person even gives orders to unclean spirits and they obey. And immediately news of Jesus began to spread through, spread through the surrounding region of Galilee. And upon leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever and immediately they told Jesus about her. And Jesus went over to her, took her by the hand, and helped her up. And the fever left her. And then she went about her work. After sunset, as evening drew on, they brought to Jesus all who were ill and possessed by demons. Everyone in the town crowded around the door, pressed in. Jesus healed many who were sick with different diseases and cast out many demons. But Jesus would not permit the demons to speak because they knew who he was. And rising early the next morning, Jesus went off to a lonely place in the desert and prayed there. Simon and some companions managed to find Jesus and said to him, Everybody's looking for you. Jesus said to them, Let us move on to the neighboring villages so that I may proclaim the good news there also, for this is what I've come to do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Unclean spirits. Wow, there's a lot in that gospel passage. So, go back to the children's sermon for a minute. Here, our temptation is still on the pulpit, you see. There's the pixie sticks. <laughs> 11 plus, not in a serving. So, remember last week when I talked about um, temptation of McDonald's? Does anybody else have McDonald's temptation? Was anybody else... <clears throat> Okay, Randy says, raising his hand. I just outed Randy. Sorry, Randy. <laughs> um, did anybody else grow up hearing something like this? Hit it, music department. McDonald's is your kind of place. Hamburgers in your face. Dip pickles up your nose. French fries between your toes. And don't forget those yummy shakes. Okay, so when Julia first told me about this, I don't remember hearing this in South Dakota. I think it's a Wisconsin thing, but we are honoring Julia's culture because that's. We thought how... it might be a, Cul a Culver's dig, but we thought it might be a Culver's <laughs> dig. Too close. <laughs> we loves we loves the Culvers. I love the Culvers. Anyway, here's the thing. It's like one of my colleagues says, "Those French fries are not just French fries. They're my friends." And if one were going to have French fries, which size should you order? Because, you know, I know like when I remember in the 70s that was considered a large is now a medium. And then there's a super size and then we had the dino size ones in the 90s briefly. And you should really only have the small. And the thing about fast food is that you might feel good for a little while, and it's not, nothing wrong with having it once in a while, but if it's what we eat all the time, there's going to be a problem. There's a movie about that. We're all tempted <laughs> in a lot of different ways. Many, many ways. So again, remember last week, or maybe this is the first week you're joining us, we, we did some reflecting about not only our food consumption, but our media consumption when it comes to what we are taking into our spirits and our bodies. So did you notice, thinking back on your week, think back on your week, did you notice anything about your viewing habits that you paid closer attention to? Thinking about temptations that come our way, the temptation to despair, the temptation to um, blame someone else, whatever it might be. I want us to keep thinking about our media consumption, especially as we're still isolated socially. In all those different temptations that we face, and we all do, the scriptures have something to say to us. <laughs> Today's gospel um, are just a couple of examples of different scenes where Jesus is casting out demons. The other examples would be the young girl that was possessed with her mother pleading for her, the crazed man in the wilderness, 
the ever popular, might be my personal favorite, the demons that get cast into the herd of swine that go over the cliff like a bunch of lemmings. What's kind of bothered me, it's not the pig's fault, but there's that story. Oftentimes in the scriptures, the demons are referred to in the plural, whether it's two or whether it's legion, which is a lot. Now, by our current medical, spiritual, and therapeutic standards of our time, all of the demons that are mentioned in the gospel, they're likely some forms of mental illness, is what scholars would tell us today, but they Our ancestors in faith didn't know that. And in our popular culture, our movies, our TV, etc., the movie depictions of demon casting out really runs the gamut too, doesn't it? So think about that in relationship to the scriptures. Probably the most famous one is the movie Carrie, and I don't need to go into the gory details, but it's about telekinetic revenge when someone is wrong to you. Or from the Lord of the Rings again, Gandalf casting out the evil wizard Saruman so that the king of Rohan would be free again. Or the Lady Galadriel standing up against the king of the Nazgul with the light of Erendiel saying that he shall not advance his evil schemes. All images of casting out demons that oftentimes involve light and smoke and thunder and lightning and this dramatic swell of the music. Got to have some strings for sure and a lot of percussion probably. And so as I'm reading this text again, I'm thinking, what does demon casting look like for us today? What is the casting out of demons as Jesus did? What does that look like for us? I remember one time being asked by some colleagues about exorcism. Now, we didn't cover that in seminary. (laughs) That wasn't something that was in the syllabus. (laughs) Um, and, and I remember Lutheran friends talking with colleagues about this, and they said, you know, if that happens, you maybe should call the Episcopalians, okay? But I, that's really never something I've been asked to deal with as a pastor, or have I? I mean, I've done house blessings where people think there's something strange. I've certainly met with people struggling with all kinds of things, because that's what it means to be human. And I I just wonder, what was it that Jesus did to free people from the demons? He wouldn't let them speak, for one. But regardless of what we might think about demons, I do believe that demons in some form are real. But it's not the popular image we might grow up with, like the angel on the one side, right? And the devil over here, and they're poking at you. That's too easy to let ourselves off the hook. Because I think, in reality, the demons that we face, and we we talk about these things here at Champlin, are the compulsions and the addictions, the fears that can run our daily lives. And like, we know from our pastoral care training that with any kind of addictive behavior, whatever it might be, that the addiction is always a secondary issue here, but what's underneath it is what's driving it. So up here in these addictions that could be chemical abuse of any kind, gambling, pornography, food addiction, being addicted to our electronics, overspending, collections that go overboard into hoarding maybe, um, sexual addictions, and the list goes on, too many pixie sticks. It could be anything. But as when we're dealing with addictions, all of those compulsions, all of those behaviors that can drive people are always rooted in a deeper need for something. For comfort, for power, for control, for a sense of peace. Because something feels out of control inside and gets passed down through the generations. Or something in that person's environment is driving some of that behavior. Now, these are very complicated things, but it's important to think about them. And instead of facing down those demons of choice that any of us have, we so oftentimes as human beings act out in compulsions toward ourselves and others, especially during COVID time. My goodness, we're coming up on a year of this. And people lie to cover their tracks. People lie to themselves and to other people and commit any sort of manner of self-destruction. Those are the kinds of demons I think everyone faces at different times. And in this gospel scene, what caught my attention along with all of that is 
the plural quality of the word. When the demon speaks back to Jesus, he says, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you catch that? This unnamed man speaks of himself in the plural. Now, on the one hand, I think we could, we could think about that in relationship to that addictions oftentimes go in pairs. It could be alcohol and gambling. It could be sex addiction and drugs, overspending and overeating, any combo platter of that, that's not uncommon. But I think in the sense of healing from all of that, there's a movement to bring a singular self instead of a plural self back together. Now that's an abstract thing to say. So what I mean to say is that there's a singular self to be restored, not a plural self. To not live a bifurcated, a truncated, a disconnected life where there's more than one person at war inside of us. In this COVID recovery time, there's such potential for toxic behavior. People can get stuck in codependency, people-pleasing, enabling, all kinds of addictions. But what our faith tells us is that if we put the work in, if we work with the supports that are available to us and we do the hard spiritual, emotional, physical, mental work, those demons do not have to hold power over us because our God and our Jesus are stronger than that. So what do we do? We do what Jesus did We tell ourselves first and foremost the truth because that's what Jesus did when he called these things out. He named what he saw. And we have to do this, siblings in Christ, for ourselves first and foremost. And in love, do that for other people whom we care about and do that work carefully. So again, tell the truth to ourselves if there's anything that we need to work on as we battle our own demons. So here's our homework for the week. Friends, is there a demon in your life that you might need to face down? If there isn't, hallelujah, that's a great thing, and I, that's amazing. But if there is one, what is their name? Where will you begin to address that? And how can you in your prayer life bring that before our God who is greater than any struggle that we have. Again, it's not a light switch, but it is an opening of ourselves to healing and wholeness. I think as these COVID days wear on, one caveat I'll give toward the end of the sermon here is as we're sorting these things out, I think we have to be really careful that in our social media practices, as we do that to stay connected to each other, that in being externally focused like that, if we overdo that kind of stuff, there may be something inside that we're not paying attention to that we need to do some balancing. So that's something to always check in your spiritual checkup. We don't need to constantly be checking our phones, as tempting as it might be. And I think as we head into Lent, I just want to name that, that we can maybe as a goal have 10 minutes alone with God each day. If we can do a half an hour or get out for that walk, however you spend time alone with God, because this will help sort out the kind of work that we need to do as we head into the wilderness of Lent together. Now, I've given you a lot to think about. (laughs) Just know that in these complicated things of life that you have a church family, even when we're not physically together, we're rooting for you, and we know we're rooting for one another. Thanks be to God that in Christ we are more than conquerors, no matter how long it takes. In Jesus' name, amen.
We are so grateful for your ongoing generous support of our ministries. There's a reminder on the screen of our option to give online. Of course, we always welcome gifts to be received at the church office securely as well. But let us be in a time of offering as we offer our lives to God. Pray with me. Holy exorcist, <laughs> deliverer, healer, we are amazed by your healing power. With absolute authority, you silence the spirits of evil within us, around us, among us. You call out the anger and fear that has taken up residence in our communities, disturbing and disrupting attempts at transforming our legalistic views. Deliver us, we pray, to new life in you as you teach as us to seek peace and to pursue it, to love God with all our hearts and souls and minds and strength, and to love our neighbors as much as we appear to love ourselves. Rabbi, master, teacher, we are astounded by your wisdom and confidence. You step into our places of disagreement and challenge our power structures. You demonstrate a new model for living as God's beloved children. You send us out shaking and shuddering and howling as we spread the news across your earth of your indisputable knowledge and the ways in which you use it to better the world. Inspire us anew to follow your lead, to step into the gap created by the false good news of authoritarian leaders and to create space for honest conversation about the God whose love is deeper and wider than any love that we can imagine and what it means to love inclusively and expansively in a world that has grown accustomed to exclusivity and inward focus. Restore us, O oh God, to one people throughout the earth, citizens of the kingdom where hope reigns eternal and love is the ultimate authority. In the name of the Creator and the Christ and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. <laughs>
I don't know if I fear the Lord as I ought, but I am in awe of the majesty of creation. I don't know if I fear the Lord as I ought, but I tremble in the presence of grace. I don't know if I fear the Lord as I ought, but I step out firmly in trust on divine promises. I don't know if I fear the Lord as I ought, but I rest in consolation of eternal love. I don't know if I fear the Lord as I ought, but I respect that true judgment belongs to God alone. And I don't know if I fear the Lord as I ought, but I sag under the relief of forgiveness. I don't know if I fear the Lord as I ought, but I believe my doubts will not be punished. I pray that for me, for others, for you, that this may be the beginning of wisdom. Amen. And see you next week. Amen.